Summer, as far as the, a lot of our summer tourists, most of them are gone, not all of them. But uh, I thought today would be a quieter day. You proved me wrong. I guess I guess we got a good program, good speaker on tap. Uh, but again, I want to welcome everyone to our uh, Sesco Centennial History at Noon. I am Tom LeClaire. I am the Clayton Town and Village Historian. And as part of our 150th year, we've done an expanded History at Noon program. If you're familiar, most of the time these programs are just in the July, August, possibly September, but we've been doing these ever since January and they will conclude in December. So we did that special for the 150th year. Now this is a partnership uh, program. We got the folks at the Thousand Island Museum, myself as the historian. Uh, we got the Sesquicentennial Historical Committee. We have the Clayton Opera House, and today we have the Grindstone uh, uh, History and Research Center as part of our umbrella bringing this program to you today. I uh, just want to throw out a reminder, we do have a Victorian house tour that's coming up Friday. Just show up at the Thousand Islands Museum a little bit before 11. There's no cost, but Carolyn Youngs is taking folks around on the, the Victorian home tour. And we have a cemetery tour that's coming up on the 24th, which is Saturday, and that's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So a few of those uh, programs that we invite you to participate in, again, no cost. Uh, with today, we got Kenny Bradwell, and he's well known throughout the community. I've gotten to know him and his wife, Melody, quite uh, well, better throughout the sesquicentennial year, and he has uh, offered or agreed to talk about grindstone. So Kenny, I'm gonna turn the time over to you. And thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, let's see. Get my notes off without notice. First thing I got to do is talk about Tom. He's done such a great job at this. All of this is really blown up, hasn't it? Yes. And it's really nice. And we also got our administrators and Patty. They've all done really good. So, okay. Well, first, I'm Kenny Bradwell, but I'm Kenny Mike. My father was Kenneth Flint, and he was named after his mother's family because my uh, my grandmother was a Flint. Uh, the Flints had a farm over on Grindstone, but before that they made their money in the gold rush. And then came back to Clayton and bought a lot of the head of Grindstone. Uh, they actually had a furniture factory over beside the municipal dock. There was a three-story building there that built furniture, fine furniture. There's some where I work and a lot of other places, but really nice job. Uh, my mother was Bernie Secor across the street, run the restaurant for years. Uh, she raised us kids and all like that. Uh, she got remarried to Ray Secor. Uh, he is my good stepfather. He was the guy in charge of all when they changed the plumbing plate and the clerk of the works for doing the new pipes and all that through plane. Um, let's see, I'll go a little beyond that and then I'll get on to grindstone. My grandfather was Erwin Dodge on my mother's side. He was brother to Emmett Dodge. On the other side, was uh, my grandfather, Peter Bradwell. He <coughs> was killed on a ship at about the age of 33, I believe. Uh, he was knocked off a ship during a storm. So that's where I come from. Well, let's see, next page here, without notes. <laughs> okay, what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna cheat a little. I'm gonna have my wife read a little section from Susie Smith. Susie Smith's around all over now. You can see her everywhere. She's from outside Dan. She does a lot of stuff here in Clayton and all around. She wrote a book. For some of you. And we're gonna cheat and just let her read the first part on how I so started. And then I'll go back to my talk. So she had just a little section on each island and we stumbled across this one about a week ago for Grindstone Island. It says it was named after Sir Francis Gore, uh, born 1759, died 1852. Gore first served in the British Army and obtained a commission in an infantry regiment. He retired a major. In 1804, he was appointed Lieutenant Governor of Bermuda. In 1806, he became Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada. 
He was serving in this position when the War of 1812 was declared. During the war, he left Canada on leave and did not return until 1815. He was not a popular governor, and he said he is said to have carried on his official duties, quote, in a high-handed manner, behavior. After leaving Canada, he was appointed a deputy teller of the Exchequer, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but it's the British Exchequer. Treasury anyway, and held the position for 20 years. The island was traditionally known as Grindstone Island before Captain Owen made his survey in 1816 and has always been known locally by that name. Grindstone Island was first settled in 1802. The first island residents were lumbermen who cut the timber from the island and lashed the logs into rafts to be sent down river and sold in Montreal or Quebec City. Among the first settlers were Amariah Howe, Daniel Gross, Lewis Jones, Anthony Lintz, Samuel Johnson, and William Wells. The international boundary line was drawn through the islands in 1822, allowing the first patent of sale of the United States Islands in 1823 to Elijah Camp of Sackett's Harbor. The island then became private land and those living there had to purchase their properties. One of the problems of ownership was described in early county histories as the War of Grindstone Island and was depicted in this way. A quantity of pine lump timber had been cut and prepared for rafting, which was claimed by the patentee, but was <coughs> refused to be given up by the parties in whose possession it was, finding it probable that any attempt to serve legal papers upon those alleged to be trespassers would be resisted. A detachment of militia from Lyme under Captain S. Green was called out. The timber had mostly been passed over into British waters, and after some firing, the party in charge of the timber dispersed. One of the militiamen was accidentally killed by the discharge of his own gun. The question subsequently became a subject of litigation and was finally settled by arbitration. In the late 1870s, Robert Forsyth, who had come from Thurso, Scotland, and had settled in Montreal, began to quarry the granite from Grindstone Island to use in his cemetery monument works in Montreal. He brought Scottish stonecutters to the island and developed several quarries. The new, those new residents gave the name Thurso to the post office. David Black, nephew of Robert Forsyth's wife, was in charge of the quarry. James Kelly was the foreman. Derricks were erupted and docks built to take the granite to cities along the St. Lawrence and the Great Lakes. About 250 quarrymen were employed, and at one time there were four quarry operations on the island, most of them closed about 1900. That's the early history, and that's Susan's book. Very good, very good. Um, next, I want to make sure that I mention the Heritage Center and the museums over on Grindstone. If you go over up to the four corners, the old school, that's one of them. The other one's at the lower end of the road here. So if you get your bicycle over there or something like that, take a look. Except for, I think they're both closed down for the season now. You got to do it during the summer. Um, they wanted me to talk about what Grindstone give to the mainland. And the biggest thing I think it gave to the mainland was talented people. So many people would grow up on grindstone, and it wasn't like growing up on a dead end road in Kansas. It was quite different. You dealt with the river, the river people, the farms, oh, I can go on and on and on. So they really learned a lot. They were exposed to a lot, and they learned a lot. Uh, you bump into people all around that are from grindstone originally, like that, a lot of the old families. Um, we had a cheese factory over there that really kept the island going for a long time, kept all the farmers going. And that was in the middle of the island. Let's see if I can get it right, get my corners right. Oop, right down in here, cheese factory. And that really hopped for a lot of years and kept the so going. And everybody sold their milk, except for uh, one of the farms where I used to work, Maggie Cananans. They got to sell their milk for a little bit more because they had jerseys and they got much better cream content and all like that. <laughs> and that is only eight years ago. Uh, next, we had the quarry in Thurstle Bay. Actually, there was four quarries on Grindstone. Oh, let's see, quarry. Well, if you come out of Potter's Beach to the corner of the lot here, and if you take a walk through here in a crescent shape, there's like seven quarries through there. And it comes out over on the road by the barn that has had the funny face on it, like that. But it's seven quarries. 
The big thing to remember when they were quarrying, before that they cut all the wood off right and so on. They cut everything down because it's so easy to take it away for the steamships and ship it to Europe. So they cut everything. Uh, so if you were standing anywhere on the island, you could see the water. Uh, there's another big quarry here, over oh, there, right over here, at the end, and that's I think one of the bigger ones on this side, but they could float everything out of the bay here. And it made it so you could get rid of it. The rock went all over. It went to Chicago, went to New York City. I heard the New York City Library had it in it. Uh, a couple of other things. Bring it down. Um, there's quarries down on the other end, but just small quarries and like that. Uh, when we're talking about hay and stuff, I hate to get a little off on the subject, but if you're looking for Indian artifacts, everything's found on this end of the island, nothing on this end. The reason for that is the way the wind blows, flips everything over up here, so you only find it on the bottom. See, who do I got that? The quarry people. The quarry kept going to the for quite a while. It was quite a hopping business. Uh, I wish Will Snowsbury was still around. He had all kinds of pictures and knew all kinds of history on it, and there was quite a bit going on down there. Uh, if you go down the lower bay below Clayton, there's a section of shoreline there that's all granite. And I bet you Mr. Emery owned that, so it all went with a lot of the quarries here that Mr. Emery owned. And they shipped stuff out through Clayton that way and in a lot of other ways. Um, so much stuff on Grindstone, they had to get rid of in the wintertime to haul it because, you, couldn't, you know, if you haul that boat, you need a big boat. But in the wintertime, we know what kind of ice we used to get. Years ago, when you lived on Grindstone, you had up to three months of crossing on the ice. We know what we got now. We don't even have a day or two to cross anymore. It got from three months to two months to one month to where we are now. But that's kind of impressive. Uh, another big thing years ago that was going on the island was a diamond farm. Let's see, this island was almost cut in two by this marsh here. And they put a big steam pump right there to pump out all this bay. That's a little bridge sway point. And it pumped all the water out of there, and they go produce up in there. But the hotels and all like that, and the people. But it was called the Diamond Farm. But if, if, when you're up in here uh, looking at things, you find where they put logs, cedar logs, in a lot of the runoff and like that to make the water flow all right and all like that. It must have been quite a production at one time. But the Diamond Farm. Nothing really no, not through diamonds. You may yeah. call it the diamond farm. Okay. Oh, I got a little more touch on the Indians. The Indian mountains on the lower end of Rhinestone. Down to New Point like that. They're supposed to be some of the biggest ones. Oh, perfect. On the East Coast. So it's quite the thing. Uh, I shouldn't say this, but I was down there with a guy once. You're not supposed to dig anything, but he was an archaeologist. And he showed me down there when he was in the place we're at. He cut a one foot square with a knife, peeled the sod back. It's like a junkyard down there in places underneath the sod because they would got through things. They'd break the pottery and all like that. And there's just tons of it down there. They lived there for quite a while and did quite a bit. So, but the other end of the island, you'll find nothing on it because it's all been turned over by the water and like that. Okay, let's see. Roads. I ain't showing them bouncing around, but there's so much to talk about I can talk for hours. The roads, we kind of had a little agreement over the years. You don't bother us, we won't bother you for manicured roads. So that's the way it's gone. We have no police service unless we call for them or anything like that. But it's going to come to a point here sometime. But it's, it's quite different over there uh, seeing a little kid pass you by in a car. <laughs> Especially if he's so small that he has to have an oil jug behind him to hold him up against the steering wheel and reach the brakes. <laughs> My son started out driving over there and got to drive to school in fifth and sixth grade. In sixth grade, he'd go to the docks and pick up a teacher in a car that had no brakes. <laughs> that was fun stuff. Okay, you know, once upon a time, they come over and they put rope signs all over the rhinestone. Stop signs, all that stuff. 
Somebody over there went around and tore every one of them out and threw them in the river. <laughs> There's a couple over there now, but they don't go over and put a bunch of signs out anymore. How old were you when you did that? No, no. <laughs> I did a few things there. <laughs> you had to read the book. <laughs> okay. Oh, let's see. The Slates, years ago, had a shipyard. If I can't remember where it is. Yeah, Slate Shipyard right there. And they made a lot of boats and stuff like that. And there's also a Civil War cemetery down in here. But Ransom has a few cemeteries. The Civil War one it has a normal one up here. There's one by the, a private one by the wealthier people up here. There's a little one over here by Aunt James Bay. And according to the farmer that I used to work for, this is back here to go. People would have a child that wouldn't live through birth and just went out behind the barn and buried them there and that was very much position. Nothing was said and like that. So oh, that was a little shocker to hear, but it's the way life went. Let's see, there's quite a few people I'm not mentioning today because there's so many people who grow up on Brian's home. Uh, Charlie Benson's here. He owned all this big farm here and a lot of woods and all like that. Um, I used to worked for Maddie Cannon, and Maddie was Finnish, he came from Finland. His English was horrible. And I can still hear him go, see stuff nice, I mean. <laughs> yeah. But uh, he was a strong man, very, very strong. He was a bachelor, liked to drink a little, but he was a very nice guy. Anything I ever wanted to do, he'd buy yeah, I do his hand for him like that, but a nice, nice guy. Another farmer I worked for was Charlie Matthews. Charlie was quite a guy too, he was a character. He would call the dances over the grindstone. By halfway through the night, you'd have to really concentrate to figure out what you're saying. Because he had a few beers and like that. But the nicest, nicest guy, I'll never forget. I worked over there on all the farm work from farm to farm working. I had no record to go to Clayton. Nothing was over there that I wanted. I stayed at Brent. Well, all of a sudden, we found out that somebody accused me of breaking in a soft drink machine. Well, I'm there in the living room, Charlie. He calls this lady up and accused me. Oh, 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 I can't tell you the whole phone call, but I was so proud of him. <laughs> <laughs> he was quite a guy, yeah. Oh, well, let's see. Next case. Oh, also, the Rushos. I worked a lot for the Rushos on the Rushall farm. I worked a lot on their barge and like that. Leon was a very good shipwright. Leon used to go into other humans and go work. Oh, I'm just going to say. Probably say I'll go in there, so. Yeah, Leon was a shipwright, very, very talented guy. And all his family was all talented, too. But I used to go to Florida and drive him home. <laughs> Hello, I gotta go. Yeah, right. <laughs> hey, my army buddy called me. <laughs> okay. So, okay, we're at Marshall's on the barge talking about him being a shipwright. And uh, Leon was so talented. He used to go to all the other places, like he'd work out on Cayman, and they had a big sailboat out there, and other places he'd go work on big stuff. You look at the work he'd do, wow, we're sure missing some talent nowadays. Um, we had Francis Garnsey, yeah. used to run mail. Uh, used to run that mail boat, used to drive us kids nuts because he'd run it about a corner speed car. <laughs> we'd all be, <laughs> but he was good with engines, good with machinery. All the farmers knew it. They all wanted them to run the machine, their machinery like that, because he knew Francis would so take his time and wouldn't call him things and like that. He was very down there. Yeah. Run the mail for all those years. Yeah. <sighs> you remember Harry Slade, anybody? Oh, yeah. Irma Slade's dad had the big lump on his head. You say, my wife took this to me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's Buck, the Buck was quite a character. Uh, sometimes he wasn't the most ambitious, but you had a problem, he'd be the first one to your house to help you. Yeah. You know, Stop and Sean, there's a character. Yeah. He's my predecessor where I work. 
I work at a big estate of a really dope for the ambassador to Russia. And Stuff was a caretaker there back years ago. Stuff the character. <laughs> he told me a few stories about working over there. Henry Kissinger visited the place once. There was a world famous piano player who said to visit the place once. But Stuff and that guy didn't see eye to eye and had quite a few run ins and like that. But he was telling me the juicy stuff. The big house where I work, it's really nice. It was, as I said, it's built originally for the guy who was the ambassador to Russia and then later became the ambassador to France, so Mr. Bowens. And then later it was sold for Mr. Bacon. Mr. Bacon's house in Washington, D.C., the house in the grounds was one whole city block. It was within sight of the White House. And this was his cottage. So, and he'd come up in the spring with his entourage and all like that. Uh, when Mrs. Bacon came to the island years ago, that was quite an event. She was a very nice lady. She was the president of the Republicans Women's Society or something like that, but a very wealthy woman. When she came to Grindstone, she would buy presents for all the kids. She'd buy dresses for all the girls. She'd buy toys for all the boys or different things for the boys, but every year she'd do that. That's very nice of her. That stuff worked for her. Uh, People I work for, I've worked for them for 37 years, made me a nice home, and they're a very nice family. They, they're really nice. The only thing that's bad is my boss's maiden name is Dodge, and my mother's maiden name is Dodge, we're not related. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, that's why that goes. Okay. Now, if I went way back on the head of we talk about the Red Boat House. There was a boat house up here at the head of the island. And they would have some wild parties. All the old timers talked. A lot of old timers couldn't go because they weren't old enough to go to the Red Boat House. They had big slips and they rolled these boards all over the top of slips and they had dances out there and that place would be really hot. But it had quite a reputation. The Red Boat House ahead of Rhinestone. So, um, Red Boat was over there. There's Cement Point. Let's see if I can get my points right here. Yeah, Cement Point here. It was James Hewitt Morgan's place originally. And he was where a lot of the money that had the island came from. A lot of these people that live there now are all descendants of his, the Morgans. Yeah. And it's not JP, it's JH. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that J, they were good friends, but not related. That's what I heard from the great man. Oh, Ian Garnsey, I talked with him once. He talked about when he got the first car over there. He talked about his dad ordered it, had it delivered, and it was at the barge landing. Well, he drove it up, got it, figured it out, and drove it up on the barge landing, got it out of it, wouldn't drive it again because the damn thing was too fast. <laughs> <laughs> so they put it in the turkey coop. Turkey pooped all over, the tires were flat and all like that. He says, one day the boys got her out, well, dad wasn't around. They cleaned her up, got it all aired out, and they run the heck right out of it. <laughs> The dance hall. There's probably a few of you been to the dance halls there. You know, pay your money to get in and have a good time. And <laughs> I can tell some stories here, but uh, I won't. <laughs> but the dance hall originally was set up by my great uncle Emmett Dodge. And it was a two story building. And there was a store where the, it was. And they got rid of the store and cut the top floor off and turned it into the dance hall for Frank Stone. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Emma was one boy. Emma had a bunch of kids. He had a set of twin boys, John and Jim and John, identical. And they had a lot of fun. I'm right? so crazy a lot now. <laughs> you know, twins. Oh, let's see. Coach's brother? Avis Couch's brother. Avis was a sister, yeah. Yeah, Avis was just as full of fun as they were. Yeah, we all know Avis, yeah. She was pretty crazy. Uh, she was my cousin, Avis was. My mother was a Dodge. Now, uh, it's not right so history, but I have another uncle, the gal's place. Their ancestors was another one of my uncle. It was Ford Dodge. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, 
kind of think what I've missed out here. I just worry he's going to have too much, and I don't. So, but uh, Canoe Point, the big thing down there is the, all the Indians. This was just so much Indians. They went down. They fished for the eels down here, and a, a lot of stuff happened on the lower end. Myself, I don't know how they stayed down there because the mosquitoes are so bad on this end of the island. <laughs> That's what's nice about. I got to brag a little more about where I work. Time to head the island. The wind blows by it. We hardly ever had mosquitoes. Never had to blow the big deer flies or anything like that. But you go over and stand on one of these other docks, and whoa, <laughs> they're going to get you. Um, the big house here, where I work, it's almost 10,000 square feet. It's, it's pretty impressive. It's very nice. It has 11 fireplaces. Yeah. But when the, the last family lived there, when they came up and they brought their entourage, it was quite a production. And like that. My boss lives much simpler, but uh, a very nice lady. She comes up and lives alone in this big house, and her kids come and visit her. She's 94 years old, full of pep, and yeah, yeah I worked for her for that 37 years, and that's been a nice family to be around. But uh, if you're ever up at 615, you'll see my boat going across the grindstone. I get my old junk car here, across the island I go. And that saves me from going through the waves all the way around the top of the island. A lot of waves. But uh, my car just broke. I got to buy a new jumper. <laughs> <laughs> a little more about Manny's Farm. Manny's Farm was a really big farm when they built it up. They kept buying more and more land. It ended up being 420 acres ahead of Grindstone. And as I said, he had those Jersey cows. And all these back fields that are now just hay fields like that, they planted them with potatoes and corn and all kinds of stuff. It really was a production. And they sold this stuff all over. They sold it to the neighboring islands and all like that. And they came from Finland, and they, their daughter hadn't come across yet. And she couldn't get her papers to come across. And Mr. Pananen was out delivering milk to my boss's father, Mr. Dodge. And he told Mr. Dodge, I tried to get my daughter out of Finland, I can't get her over here. Well, Mr. Dodge wrote him a letter and told him to send it to her daughter and for her to take it to the consulate. She did that. In the United States, she gave. Uh, that's very nice. Uh, well, I think that's about it. I'm trying to think if there's any questions. How about the schools? The school, took, there was the upper schoolhouse and the lower schoolhouse. And make sure to get over and see them because they're now museums. And there's, you know, they have a lot of stuff. They have all these discs at the supper schoolhouse. And you can look at the discs and see the histories of all these different families. They talk about their history like that. It's very interesting. There's a lot of pictures in the lower one, a lot of pictures to see down there. But uh, if you notice what he wants to ride around on a bicycle, it's a neat place to ride around on a bike, except for being sure where I have. <laughs> yeah. I'm not from the area. Grindstone is seven miles long by three miles wide. Okay. Now, when I had my first car on Grindstone, being a 14 year old, I put in spring, summer, and fall 5,000 miles on that car in <laughs> one summer. <laughs> but it's my first car, so. <laughs> but it was a 1958 Thunderbird. And it got two to three miles a gallon. <laughs> Where'd you get the gas for that, Ken? Oh, uh, <laughs> And if you want the answer to that question, you gotta get it. Gotta read the book. Read the book. <laughs> you gotta read the book. Uh, we're coming out with a second one that's gonna be a little livelier, too. <laughs> oh. mm -hmm. Yeah, he's and, my uncle. Yes, he is. Yeah. And he marries my father's sister, Hank. Oh, I didn't know that. Ah. Yeah, so we're indirectly related. Ah. <laughs> Which is good. So, uncle, his father worked in the cheese factory. And you know, the years I remember him back in the 50s, because they go to Florida with it, their homemade trail. Mm -hmm. To he would make 
liver shape. Uh, he sold it as fast as he could make it, and he stored it in the basement. So I tried it once. I haven't tried it since. <laughs> They said that rhinestone cheese was a quite a different cheese and it had a different flavor and they blamed it on the grass growing on the ground or something, yeah. Good. But it, they said it was a very good cheese. A lot of the old times would joke about what was in it, but <laughs> <laughs> you know. Oh, let's see. Uh, what about the gold mine? The gold oh, he forgot about this. Actually it wasn't a gold mine, it was a silver mine. A silver mine. Silver mine. My great uncle was Thomas Glenn, and he dug a mine on the baseline over here. And it goes back there about 60 feet, curves off one way, and the locals all called it Flynn's Folly. <laughs> <laughs> but he did get a little bit of silver out, but only a little. Mainly got uh, quartz, a lot of quartz come out of it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he was a miner. Not that that's how he made his original money. He was and the gold run up to Alaska and California yet. So. The Flynn's were very tough. My aunt told me that one of the Flynn's played in John Phillips was his band. Yeah. So, and then my aunt says they married in those gravels and went all to hell. <laughs> <laughs> Just hobby farms, actually. But the the slaves. We got Irma Slate here. Irma Slate still raised cows. The Browns still have some. I don't think they do. I think they still have a few. Uh, there might be involved in it. I think they're well scattered. Uh, something else I want to talk about. I do a lot of volunteer work. I kind of retired from it, but for the land trust. And there used to be all these farms around down here in the bottom end of the island. And they all turned into a bush. You could walk through it save anything and we cleaned them all out made them all nice grassy fields where the birds can live and all like that it's very nice now like i also got a command on potter's beach potter's beach now could have townhouses all the way down through it and docks all the way down through it but the land trust changed it made it so we can always our kids and on and on and use it if we don't take care of things now <laughs> Yeah, can you, if you park your boat at Potter's Beach, can you legally walk the island or is it Yes, you can. Posted? You can. You can park your boat there and the dance hall is just on the road. Okay. Yeah. It's and it's in the church. It's about from a Potter's Beach all the way across the island. I've been in my car break now. It's about three and a half miles. Yeah. What's the population? The population in the summer is about 1,400, and a winter at six. <laughs> <laughs> when you're on the road, you see something, you got to stop and talk, because you know you know them. <laughs> sure, I'll be here tonight, and you're right here. Yeah, I'm an islander. I'm 93, <laughs> and I lived in the store, and my great-grandfather had the shipyard and um the um my the slate shipyard the slate shipyard okay. was my great-grandfather's and the quarry one of the quarries was my grandfather on the other side the turcot side i was a turcot and um uh, and you're the also turcot, for the the Turcot Garden, the Gordon Turcot quarry was the one you pointed out there. You've done a good job, Kenny. Oh, okay. <laughs> Actually, to be honest, I'm a freshman. The way they fell in love with the <laughs> And I lived in the store, and my mother was the postmistress in the store. So, um, and I went to school eight years in the Little Red Schoolhouse. No. Before we came to high school, we had to board over, come over, and uh, stay winters. But you walked to school, didn't you? Yes, I did walk to How school. Many miles? We had we walked. Um, I lived in the store, so it was about 
Um, a mile and a half each way, back and forth. And in the winter time, we would have to ski. Sometimes there was no uh, plows over there then. Yeah, they just packed it all, but the people going on it. And now, uh, yeah. And so I lived all that that you just talked about. <laughs> and, and Doreen his, was in the lower. Um, Doreen, she was a Calhoun. Calhoun. And a means. And she lived over there all her life. And she was on the lower end of the island. I was on the upper end. In the Did she get along? How did we know You know, that's like. Bay, that was where we catch a lot of different fish in the springtime. There's different parts of the bay are good for different kinds of fish. And the other thing that's neat is how a lot of people drag buildings all over. There's a lot of buildings that were moved around by mine, something like that. One of the good stories I heard is they took a building from up here in Buck Bay and a Canadian bought it. And they were taking it across. John Brown told me this story. And they got halfway across and they had a slush layer. Well, they had to leave it right there and it sat out there for about a week until things froze back up and they got jacked back up and they got all the way over to other Canadian islands. Well, then that guy got a hold of him and says, I'm Canadian, you're American, I ain't paying you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, but a lot of buildings went across the ice, a lot of things went across the ice. So, I sure I'm going to see ice stuff. Sure. Um, maybe a little worse. <laughs> now, see, they used to hire a farmer over there. They'd pay him to rake the road once a month. And Charlie Matthews especially did it once a month. The roads are all beautiful. We loved it that they'd rake them. He could send the cars to spin really good because all those rocks up on top. And, but they were always nice. Well, now, once a year, they come over and do them. And the rest of the year, they go downhill. <laughs> yeah. Hayes Brothers did construction all over Grindstone. They had an old Plymouth car, but it had been burned up. And I mean, it burned up. <laughs> and then you see the car springs and everything all you know, like that. And they drove it every day. That's the way Grindstone is, yeah. You never know what you're going to see driving on the road. But the big one is how kids start driving early. And they pick it right up. And kids are good at picking stuff up. Not like older people. They can just. And they, they get that edge early in life, and that it really helps them. Yeah. <clears throat> what about hunting on the island? Is there any hunting? <clears throat> there is, but the locals kind of guard it pretty heavily. You can't go on anybody's land and hunt or this or that, but being a caretaker, I wish everybody come over there and shoot some deer. We have so many deer that we have an epidemic of ticks. Yeah. Uh, about four years ago, I had 25 tick bites. Another year, I had 17 tick bites. I finally had to really dress for it and spray stuff all over me and all like that. And I got a blood thing going on now. And yeah, it's, it's a different world now with the ticks and all that over there. You go in where there's cedar trees, and all of a sudden you go, hmm, ticks. <laughs> so, and so far they've come up with a trap to get rid of them. So. It's that it. way everywhere we hear. I lived in Albany, New York for 40 years. And this, in the last 20, in a mobile home, mm -hmm. 
and that wood surrounds us on the north side of town, there's a herd of deer in there that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And honest to God, they will eat anything they can get a hold of. And more Texans, more Texans. Oh, well, hopefully they're not there yet. But they might. But honest to God, somebody illegally shot one. Do you see how them? Uh, that, that happens over in Rhino, but nobody ever finds it. <laughs> 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 yeah, but I really, being a caretaker, I'd like to see them thinned out over there. Because yeah. there's so many ticks. Nobody can have a garden. They eat everything. Uh, they're runty deer because they've eaten so much of this cow and like that. So you've seen Rhinestone in your lifetime. Um, What's your prediction? What's the future hold for Grindstone? Going to grow in population? In well, it's going to grow because it's heaven. It's yeah. going to grow, but the thing that worries me is the changes I've seen in the river in 50 years. Yeah. If it changes that much in the next 50, it could be green with a lot of dead fish floating around it. Mm -hmm. Because we now have all these allergies and stuff going nuts and dead zones and, and lots of things that are happening out know, there. The river is in flux. The type of fish we have, the type of fish we don't have anymore, the, it's different. I remember when I was young, we had coots all over. Those ducks that can't fly very good with the orange, but they were everywhere. Where are they? I haven't seen a coot since, well, a long time. But we are getting other things because of global warming. We're getting birds that we never see. Scarlet tanager, the bright red bird with black wings and like that, they're usually not up here. There's several other ones I've seen that, you know, things are changing. Okay. I thought well, zebra mussels cleaned up the water. Though. Yeah, they sure did. They made it super clear. A little sterile actually for a lot of things. But being so clear, it allows the algae to grow tougher. It allows the algae to grow better. And the algae has produced a type of botulism and then the gobies get into that, and then the birds eat that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a big, vicious thing. But, uh, but at least now we're starting to be a little conscious of it, maybe soon. Uh, any other questions on Grind Rock? I call it Grind Rock a lot. We've had more problems with the water levels going down. Did that happen before? Actually, it used to really happen. Now it's controlled. Years ago, if you went in any of the bays, Maddie Fernanda told me you come here, there was no marsh anywhere around Flint's Bay, and now it's all marsh. And it's because early in the spring, the water way up out of sight, and it ripped all that marsh off, and you'd see it all floating around out on the river. And that happened every year, and so the marsh never built up. Well, now we've controlled to keep it at a certain level. That marsh is doing great. And uh, so things are different. Yeah, we try to help. <laughs> Any other questions? Come on, one more question. I wish, I wish we all could go on a tour over there, but to get the grindstone's kind of expensive. <laughs> we have that taxi. I won't say any prices or anything. Or if you want to burn your car over, it'll cost you. That's why we don't have a police driver on over there. <laughs> that really raised their budget dead to burn those cars back and forth. <laughs> so. Next, it's a beautiful job I got. You're about to see more of me because it's about to be done for the year. <laughs> That's what I see. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Oh. And we have a uh, certificate of appreciation uh, to Kenny Bravo for uh, Grindstone uh, lecture today. Oh, well, thanks a lot. Uh, the biggest thing is that everybody. I could have gotten my hand my first summer, but I was over there a lot. My mother never seen me through the summer. Yeah, the summer she'd see me. Whoa, who are you? <laughs> Lord, how'd you hear it that way? Look like that. One other thing I wanted to add, and it's not necessarily grindstone, but you've all seen the green circles around town with the age of the building. Kenny and Melody, they're brainchild. I think well for next year. I'd like to come over overnight with a squirrel of the sunflowers and all like that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that our cells about to do a lot for yeah, plates. Doesn't yeah. the town or the village go over to Grindstone and take some of those uh, cars? Uh, uh, actually, every so many years they build up 
where there's a value in somebody going over there and getting them and bringing them off the island. But until there's enough of them, it's not worth it. So that works out. But uh, they're getting to be less and less because I worry with all these fancy off road vehicles over there. And I mean, some of these vehicles will fly. I mean, 100 mile an hour and stuff like that. And you hand them over to your kids and letting them drive around. Used to be these big old cars, they'd smash into each other. Ha 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 ha. But you get two of these off road vehicles that are true. So. And it's no mileage limit. As far as uh, speed limit. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, but you shouldn't because those gravel roads are like driving on marbles at high speed. Yeah. Trying to get to hit the deer too. Uh -huh. Bob, we used to really be able to power slide those corners. <laughs> <laughs> Before those four wheelers and three wheelers were on, we get power slide those corners. <laughs> I showed up this morning and then I just found out that the yeah, elevator okay. was out. So, so there, is there a way for them to access? Well, we got uh, Justin down there and he's taping it right now and it's going to be giving to Patty and Sean. Patty and Sean's going to put it up online. Okay. So, yep. so it's on the 150th uh, Sesquicentennial site. It's shared on the historian page and the Thousand Island Museum page. Okay. Thank you. All right. so. One more thing that amazed me over there, Charlie Matthews, the old farmer, he used to be able to drive a tractor and roll a cigarette at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I was totally amazed by that. Yeah. Well, thanks again. I'll see you around the bar.